Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, and Roth Distributing. The September episode of Feast TV celebrates St. Louis's South Side. From comfort food to beer, we're going to give you a taste of authentic South St. Louis in this episode. And I am going to be making an authentic fall dish. When you think of fall, September, October, you probably think of apples and caramel. So I am going to show you how to make caramel apples from scratch. No more running to the store, getting a bunch of caramels and melting them down. I'm gonna show you how to make the caramel itself. It's very, very easy, and it's also a lot of fun. And this recipe is from our Sweet Ideas columnist, the very talented Christy Augustine, who owns Pint Size Bakery in South St. Louis. Now, before we get into making these gorgeous caramel apples, let's head over to Quincy Street Bistro to meet Rick Lewis. He was a semi-finalist for a James Beard Award this past year, has a fine dining background, but when he came on to his family's bar and grill, he was able to meld that fine dining perspective with true South City bar and grill pub grub, and the result is something that everybody is craving. I feel like the food that we produce here is food that any guy that works in any kitchen, any chef, would probably go home and, you know, cook for themselves or their family, you know, and we just do it kind of, you know, with a lot of love and a lot of thought into it. So we take simple ingredients and simple food and, and put our, our heart into it. So these are our mashed potatoes here at Quincy Street that everybody loves so much. These are just red skin potatoes, boiled whole. We make a, uh, a veal stock for two days and make this brown gravy. Very good, it's got a little bit of double stout beer in it. It's delicious. The meatloaf is probably one of the most popular dishes at Quincy Street Bistro. We do uh, local ground chuck. We grind in our house cured bacon, a little bit of oatmeal. Uh, an array of seasonings and then we top it with kind of like a classic ketchup glaze. Zucchini, green beans, and onions that uh, we also grew at my house. Not the green beans, but the squash. The zucchini and the patty pans. The icing on the cake is just a little bit of fried uh, red onions. like what a lot of people are doing, but what you're doing is very different. So you've got, what, open-faced fried bologna sandwiches <laughs> with sunny side up eggs and like a whole bunch of gorgeous oh, yeah, yeah. bechamel That's sauce like a, on top a of it. That's a childhood it. thing to me, you My know. My mom did not make that for me. Yeah, but there was, you know, the fried bologna sandwich with like a slice of American cheese, you know. We're yeah. just taking that and, and trying to elevate it a little bit and use good ingredients and, and things like that, you know. I bring probably like anywhere from 50 to 75 pounds of uh, produce in, assorted things. You know, it changes with, with the season, spring, summer, fall, and we always grow a variety of stuff. And uh, we just started doing the bees, so we are bringing in our own honey now. And, uh, you know, that was a, a hobby. And like, it was something I grew up not around. Like my dad came from really like poor, uh, rural Southern Missouri. My dad worked really hard so that I wouldn't have to hunt and I wouldn't have to grow a garden because he grew up doing those things out of necessity, not out of fun, you know, and like... But you choose it. I choose it because it's fun to me and it's important to me. Like, I think, you know, more people need to be doing stuff like that. And it's hard because it's a busy lifestyle that we live and, and everything's crazy. But I do think you get a greater satisfaction out of life and food and everything 
from from doing that, you know. I've always maintained like a really close relationship with everybody that comes to this door because it was important to me the feedback, the you know like. I don't know, they were the neighborhood spot. Like, I, we need that connection with the community and everything like that. And, and seeing that, like, you, you'll meet people who are like, I never would have thought I'd ate that, but it was good, you know, and, and things like that. So, yeah, like, you know, I, I, I think about it all the time and I think about how people's tastes have changed because there's people that dine with us now that were dining here before I ever worked here, you know, and they're excited and they, you know, when they see the, a weight, a line out the door and a wait and you know they can't come in like they're they're kind of aggravated about that but they're happy for us yeah. you know they're like they're like man we're just gonna have to start making reservations you know so when I went over to Quincy Street Bistro for a birthday dinner about a year ago and I saw pig's head toasted ravioli on the menu, I knew that I wanted to make a return trip. The food there is great, totally approachable, just like caramel apples. So before we start to make the caramel, I'm going to go ahead and impale all of these apples with sticks. And so I have two half sheet pans just lined with parchment paper. And I have two different kinds of sticks. Now I am going to use these traditional lollipop sticks, which you can find at craft stores. You can also, if you would like, use something more like a tongue depressor or um, you know, some sort of a wooden stick. But this one, it's bright white, it's really gonna be pretty. And all you have to do is shove it into the end of your apple. The thing is, don't use a cake pop stick. They're way too short and make sure that it's rigid enough that the apple isn't gonna fall over um, when the kid grabs it. So I'm going to go ahead and go through the process of getting all of my apples prepared. So I have all 12 of my apples impaled on sticks and the fun of this recipe is that you can really make it your own. When we make the caramel, I'll show you how to spice it in different ways, but then you can also dip your apples into whatever it is that you like. And I'm gonna dip mine into three different things. I'm choosing pecan pieces, chocolate chips, and smashed up ginger snap cookies. And then some ginger snap cookies, so the easy way to smash these guys is to just put them into a Ziploc. I love the smell of ginger snaps. It's probably one of my, ginger snaps and shortbread are my favorite cookies. I mean, how boring and traditional is that? Put these guys in here, zip them up. This is something that your kids could totally do and have a really fun time smashing things in the kitchen. They're actually allowed to. You can use a rolling pin or the back of a cup. It doesn't have to be perfect. You get a bunch of ginger snap dust. We're gonna put that as our third stripe of crunchy bits right there on the sheet pan. Oh my goodness. It's a trifecta of delicious right there. So just like Rick Lewis is putting his own modern spin on classic pub grub, there are people around town that are putting their own signature on the classic St. Louis Slinger. Let's go try three of them now. So the slinger here at Southwest Diner are home fries, red potatoes that have been boiled and chopped. Here at Southwest Diner, we specialize in New Mexican as well as classic diner food. Uh, the chili sauce, uh, both red and green, are made from uh, hatched, hatched chili peppers grown in uh, New Mexico. 
Uh, the green chili, the New Mexican green chili, is made from the fresh uh, hash chilies uh, that aren't allowed to ripen. Those are roasted, peeled, and chopped, and cooked down into a sauce. Uh, no acids added, so it's not really a, a really a Mexican salsa. It's fresh, so there's no acid, no tomato, no tomatillo, no lime juice. So you're getting the pure chili flavor. This is Longhorn cheese, which is a Colby. We shred fresh. Burger patties. Got my chili sauce. We're gonna do this Christmas today, which is both the red and the green. So here's that red sauce, which is made from the same chilies as the green, but these are allowed to sun dry and mature. And the red, the green. So there's Christmas. And one thing we like to do at the diner, a lot of our customers love, is our homemade sausage gravy. This is made from homemade sausage uh, that we make from local pork, fresh herbs and spices, and nothing but cream and, uh, and milk. So it's really good, none of that canned, canned or powdered stuff. Eggs on top. And that is the Southwest Slinger. in the center, then you take your spatula and you gently pull through the hash brown, loosen them up a little bit, get your two pieces of sausage and you put them right there in the center. Uh, this one was you kid, they wanted to try something different, put half milk gravy and half slinger, if they said, can I do that? I, I can do anything I want. I've been here since a long time. So they said, okay, they liked it. So then they said, what are we going to call it? So we ended up calling it the yin yang, half black and half white. So that's the way we call the yin yang. All right, I'm going to make a uh, mud house slinger. We've got our roasted Yukon gold potatoes over here that we've already um, seasoned up a little bit, um, roasted them in the oven. This is what makes our sling a little bit different from a lot of places is that we have, it's vegetarian. It's got um, sauteed onions, red peppers, lots of spices. Um, it's got, got kind of a medium heat. It's really good. Well, I kind of inherited this, this slinger. Um, I, the only thing I've done to really change it is uh, I added an extra egg just because for me a slinger is like, you know, it's kind of a, a pig out food. So um, I wanted everyone to be totally satisfied when they ate it. Pile it up. A couple nice big scoops. A little bit of thinly sliced raw red onion is nice. A little bit of crunch and bite. Crowning glory. Two sunny eggs. There you go. A mud slinger. So as the writer of the feature in our print edition said, the Slinger is a glorious mess. And so I'm glad we had a chance to kind of show you a few different approaches to that classic around town. Now, what I have done is I have taken a quart of apple cider and I've reduced it over about an hour to just a half a cup of syrup that's remaining. And it, it takes a while, um, but it's, believe me, it's worth it because it concentrates the flavor of that apple cider. Now I'm going to whisk in one full stick of butter that's been cut into pieces so that it melts more quickly. Just whisk that in, gorgeous. This is going to serve as a big part of the base for our caramel and a lot of the flavor that we're going to be getting from the final result. And I'm going to make the other side of the base of the caramel, which is sugar and cream. Two cups of just plain old granulated sugar. We're gonna add in a cup and a half of just heavy whipping cream. Then condensed milk. 
So just stir it on relatively low heat until you can't feel those granules any longer. The sugar has dissolved and I am going to pour this into the cider syrup with the butter. Now I'm just gonna stir to combine and then I'm going to insert my candy thermometer into the mixture so I can start monitoring the temperature. So I'm going to stand and stir frequently until the caramel reaches the softball stage, which is 242, not three, not one, degrees. Okay, we are just about there. We're at 240, so I'm gonna keep stirring for just a little bit longer, and then I'm gonna go ahead and shut the, uh, the, the heat off and let it sit. I'm gonna stir in, after I've shut the heat off, I'm gonna stir in some spices. It's cardamom, cinnamon, pepper, ginger, and salt. And so this is where you can really get creative with your caramel. If you wanna leave it just plain, you can. Or if you wanna add any kind of flavor to it, this is your chance to kind of play around with, with all the different possibilities. And I do recommend that you add a little bit of salt because that's going to heighten the flavor whether you add anything else or not. We are there. So I'm just gonna turn this off, slide it off the burner. And so off the heat, I'm gonna put in all of those gorgeous spices. Okay, so at this point, you can just set this caramel to the side. And if you don't have time to dip your apples right away, you can very easily just rewarm it gently and then kind of get to dipping those apples. Okay, so I am going to set this aside for now and we're gonna dip these apples when we come back from this next segment. From Slingers to St. Louis Sandwich Shops, we're going to continue our exploration of St. Louis classics. I'm Alex Donnelly. I'm owner and operator of Joya's Deli here on the hill in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm the youngest of three sons. My mom and dad actually bought uh, Joya's from the Joya family in 1980. And uh, my dad was 22 years old. He was working at Schnucks and he, it used to be a grocery store and he drove by and saw a little for sale sign in the, and he, and he was like, I think I can do a grocery store and uh, walked in and, and bought it. And, um, and the rest is history. I'm Joe Legrand, uh, partners with my brother Jim Legrand at, in South City, uh, 4414 Donovan. It's Legrand's Market. We uh, both started here at high school. I was 16, he was 16. It, we, I started in 1980. He started in 1979, I believe. We used to actually ride our bicycles here when we started. We were young men. I, uh, I started as a bag boy. My brother Jim started as a bag boy, and then we worked our way into the meat department. And our customers started trusting us, so uh, it was wonderful when we bought the store. Everybody was very excited that the meat market was to stay in business, and uh, with the change of hands, it was still the same meat cutters that own the store. So it was, it's just a wonderful feeling knowing everybody. Joya family came over from uh, Mardell, Italy, which is Northern Italy. The Joya family and the Donnelly family have stayed really close, um, all the way up until Mary, who is uh, Mary Joya, who just lived down there. She just passed away, but she was one of the original owners. And uh, it was just, a really great relationship between us and them. So they taught us everything we needed to know. We've been in business for, uh, I think it's 96 years now. Yeah, 1918. We're known for the hot salami. We, I've been making it myself. Actually, Steve Joya, one of the, uh, the sons of the original owner, actually taught me how to make it um, with my dad. And um, I've been making it ever since. My favorite, because I created a bunch of new sandwiches, right now is probably the spicy Daggett. And that's a Volpe, it's called the Daggett because the meats are either made at Joya's or down the street at Volpe. And it's just copa, capicola, and hot salami, toasted. It's awesome. 
I love it. After we bought the store in 1989, we slowly realized that the sandwich business was a pretty good thing for us. So we uh, got a little bit creative with it. Just about every other customer buys our world famous Legend Club. <laughs> and that's, that's it's, we're very proud of that one because we make all of our own sauces and uh, we use only the boar's head lunch meat on it and that separates us from a lot of delis. The reason why I like it is because it has the garlic cream spread and the roasted red pepper sauce with the pepperoni, bacon, pastrami, Sausalito turkey, the Havarti cheese, and a super hot pepper cheese. It's a good one. This community is just, there, there's a reason it's been strong for not 100 years. It's because we understand what we are and we, we need to preserve that. And, and that's what it is. Hopefully, um, you know, we can do this another 100 years. I am craving a sandwich now, except I'm also craving one of these caramel apples. We have our spiced caramel and our impaled apples. At this point, it's really pretty easy. You just take your apple and you dip it into that rich, gorgeous caramel. <laughs> you just wanna let the excess drip off. It is still very soft and warm. And then you just take it and roll it in whatever crunchy bits you feel like adding. And there you have it. One perfect caramel apple. So this recipe is really very versatile. It allows you to create this kind of dipping caramel, but if you take the temperature on the caramel as you're making it up to 246, you can actually make the type of caramels that you slice and then wrap in waxed paper. One of the things that I was really inspired by with Christy's recipe is the way that she added all the different spices. She was really playing around with that simple base. And the people over at Perennial Beer do the exact same thing with something, again, like caramel, that is very recognizable. They take beer and they add this almost culinary perspective that is as unusual as it is unusually delicious. So let's go see what they're up to in South City. I like to call this a small batch microbrewery. We're basically in South City, St. Louis, and we've been open for nearly three years. Well, I was attracted to this industry for several reasons. One, I, I like to work with my hands. Um, two, I get a creative outlet out of it. Uh, three, I, one thing I really enjoy is being able to geek out on the different scientific aspects of, of brewing. Brewing is very complicated and has a lot of different factors, and. I feel like it's something you can never know at all. You can never be a full ec on expert. So there's always this learning that goes on every day. Uh, you know, in general, to me, collaborations are, are a lot of fun because they don't they don't always go in the same direction uh, and they always end up being executed in very different ways. We do, did one with Evil Twin very recently. Uh, that one's called Lumi Weiss. That's a, uh, a black Berliner Weiss that's steeped on dried Omani limes. What was cool about doing one, the one with Evil Twin is that you know he doesn't even have his own brewery and, and, uh, but he was very, very active. Uh, Yeppa was very active in making sure that this beer turned out the way he wanted it to be. Um, he pushed for a black Berliner Weiss, which honestly I wasn't very crazy about the idea, and he kept pushing and pushing, and so I had to figure out how do we make this without it being too roasty. And, uh, and then he's like, at the last minute, he's like, hey, have you ever worked with dried Omani limes? No, I've never even heard of these things. Uh, here, you should try these out. And uh, you know, so I, I got a pack of them in, and, and they, they were really awesome. And so we steeped them in that. And it was like he already had a vision and knew what, what this beer was going to be, and I was sort of just the vehicle for making his beer happen. I mean, I still ended up formulating the beer and you know, doing some bench trials and figuring out how to make it taste good, but I never would have come up with those ideas on my own. And that's, that's what's cool, too. You never know what's going to happen with the collaboration. 
Uh, I, I had read about Phil and he was going to come to St. Louis and he was going to start a brewery. And it was about Belgians, barrel aging, experimental, fun stuff. He hired me with no experience. I got lucky. Very, very lucky. For sure. One of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> that's for sure. So, it's good stuff. We work really well together just in general. I mean, when Corey first approached me, it only took me about five minutes to realize that that was my guy. So, so um, side projects, I guess the best way to put it, which when Phil and I were out in Napa recently getting oak, um, it's real common out there for um, winemakers to have their own private label, kind of, where they work for a winery, but then they have their own thing on the side. And it was real common out there when we were talking about it, everybody understood it, but in the beer industry, nobody seems to kind of understand what we're doing. And so Phil started mentoring me, and about six months into that, I don't know if it was it was him or him and the group or however, and they just said, why don't you just start your brewery here? Just start it with inside, with inside a perennial. Um, it's hard to label it. It's almost like a gypsy brewery, but at the same time, I work here, so I actually brew all my own beer. So side project is my little side project on the side. It's huge for us also. I mean, you know, one, we get to keep Corey around. He, um, you know, him and I have always worked so well together, and you know now we get to continue to learn from each other. Uh, you know, whether it's our mistakes or whether it's our discoveries that that positively uh, impact production methods for both perennial and side project. Um, Corey is also, you know, still employed by perennial as well. He's he is running our barrel program, our wood aging program, and will continue to take it to new heights. And uh, he also gets to grow side project here too, and I'm just excited uh, about that as well because, you know, quite frankly, side project brings a lot of buzz to perennial too. It's a, uh, I don't know of a brewery that produces less volume and has more buzz, and uh, it's it's really cool to have have Corey here and to have side project here. Thanks, Greg. The collaboration between Phil and Corey, I think, is really inspiring. The way that, you know, Corey has his gypsy brewery inside of Perennial, and both of them are working on such creative and, frankly, groundbreaking beers. Yeah, I'm really glad we had a chance to take you down and introduce you to those guys uh, today. And I would like to introduce you to these caramel apples. This is so fall, it is so fun, and it's one of those things that you, they're almost ubiquitous. You see them all the time, but hardly anybody makes them from scratch. And so I hope that this inspires you to, you know, to get in the kitchen and with your kids and make some caramel apples um, from scratch this fall. And I'm pairing this with a Traminette from Stone Hill. Now Stone Hill is in the Herman region uh, here in Missouri, and Traminette is a really interesting white wine. It has a floral nose, and it has actually kind of a, an apple crisp acidity, so it's going to go beautifully with these crisp apples and that gorgeous, gorgeous sweet caramel. So cheers to the beginning of fall, and I'll see you next month.